19 year old. Um, I'm here in downtown Los Angeles in the studio of Cory Yuka. And Cory, hey. my first question to you is, what was modernism? That is a great question. Um, honestly, I don't normally think about that that often. Um, what I will say, the only way that I, I know how to really think and talk about it at the moment is uh, when I was on my way this morning, I spoke to someone saying I was going to do this and they said, great, get your grid on. Right, and I thought that that was really interesting, a really interesting way to talk about sort of modernism because I tend not to think about it so much in the studio, um, even though I think that it informs so much of what we do, but just that easy sort of great get your grid on made me think about it in the way that I tend to deal with it. And mostly it is about the grid, right, and, and the application of the grid in artwork and the, the offness, the rigidity, the formalism, the strangeness, and just the idea that that is important and how that functions in what we do. So um, that's about all I want to, um, I can really say about um, but, but that's, that. But that's, that's, that's absolutely right, because I always think about, myself I always think about um, how the grid is, I mean, we're in downtown LA, right. which is a grid, right. I mean, totally. the whole LA is right. a grid. Right. Um, New York, where you're from. Right, and how it's been sort of overlaid on our lives in a way, but at the same time how it's potentially always been there. I, I sort of um, am interested in it that way, and I just love that get your grid on. I think that that should be a t-shirt, right? That's a perfect sort of way to think um, about it. Like it becomes like a slogan because in a way you said what was modernism, right? Yeah. So I, I tend to listen to that and hear that and go, oh, is it gone? Is it totally gone? Is it in the past now? Is it a past tense? Or are we still sort of dealing with it, even though we talk about things in a postmodern way or after modern, but I think we're still sort of in the late, late stages, perhaps, of, um, or the mature stages, let's mm -hmm. say, of what modernism can be or um, what it intended to be what people might have thought it could become, but we, we can't really ever control those things, so. Yeah, and in fact, the way I ask it is quite deliberately provocative, because. Right, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just noticing, actually, um, right behind you, I think it's probably been the camera shot. Right, the well. buildings. Yeah, right. you actually have, you know, you're talking to me then about the grid, and I can actually see, you know, you've got, um, I think it's one of those shopping carts. I do have a shopping cart, right. I, the, yeah. the grid sort of surrounds me, even, and I think it surrounds us, and. I think the interesting thing about that, and perhaps in relation to modernism, is its uh, invisibility, perhaps, and how we don't, or at least I don't necessarily think about it, but having grown up, I think, in it, it, it is everywhere, and it, to such an extent that I don't really think about it. It's sort of um, intuitive, perhaps, yeah. the, the application of it and the meaning of it and the way that it affects what I do in the studio and the way it affects just my, my life in general, mm. right, and the things that I see. It's just, um, I, I don't question it because it's just always been there for me. And I, yeah, I don't really want to question it. It's, I, I don't um, know if I'm interested in questioning it so much. I think I, I think that I have other things that I'm more curious about um, that I mean, relate I, to it, but um, but to question it purely for itself, you know, there's that's not my job. Yeah. And that moment I mean there was a time and you I think you're around the same age as me in the nineteen seventy or nineteen seventy one. Right. Uh, so we probably went to art school around about the same time and probably got the tail end right. of that kind of postmodern thinking about it. And it's just not interesting. No, anymore. Not really. I mean, it's good. 
I mean, I think we do have a relationship with it, but it's just mm -hmm. not um, the central thing. Right, I can't spend my uh, days in the studio worrying about, about those things necessarily. And, it, and I don't think about it until perhaps um, it calls attention to itself. Yeah. Right? In, in for however that happens. And then perhaps my mind goes there, but in general, um, I don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> um, initially, you, uh, you, you grew up in New York. Yes. And uh, you've been in Los Angeles for 18 years? Or so, right? At 95, and I don't, this is 2013. I don't, again, I'm an artist, so I don't do any math if yeah. I can help it, so even something simple like that is. Absolutely, you know. likewise. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, was the, what was the path that, uh, in terms of your own career, that led you from New York to, well, to now, two decades on, practicing <clears throat> Oh, well, I can't do anything else, right? I, I think I'm unable and probably unwilling to do anything else. Uh, I started my education in New York City at a school called Cooper Union, and I uh, promptly got kicked out <clears throat> of my first art school. I, uh, which, is, which is bad, to be honest. Right, I, 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 it, I've learned to look at it that way. <laughs> um, hindsight and distance has helped me go, uh, that might, mean something good. Um, yeah. So I got kicked out of my first art school in New York City and then promptly went back up state to where I was uh, raised way up in the middle of the state and sort of licked my wounds for a little bit and found myself in Chicago at the Art Institute and, uh, and finished my undergraduate studies there. Uh, which was really great, also surrounded by sort of great architecture, right? The mm. sort of a pinnacle of perhaps American modernism as it applies to, to that. Um, and again, didn't really think about it because it was just everywhere. Um, so I think it, it soaks into me. Um, after Chicago, I went back to New York, back to not to the city, but to the sort of country for about two years. and. Decided it was time for graduate school and realized no more New York. Chicago was not an option, um, particularly. And I thought, oh, I'd always wanted to go to California. I had already headed west, you know, to the Midwest, and I thought, mm. let's just keep going. And um, Los Angeles sort of appeared. I came to visit uh, and was seduced. Right, in many ways, but mostly by the idea that it was February and it was 70 degrees, and the mailman was running around in little shorts, and there's you know palm trees, and it was just wonderful. And uh, got into grad school at the University of California, Irvine, and um, just have worked ever since. I think from the time of, as a, right after graduation, just tried my best to sort of navigate this art world thing. And I'm still here, trying every day to continue to navigate this art world thing as it changes and evolves from that time to, to right now. Is there a very, well, in what ways, uh, in what ways is you, your Los Angeles difference for an artist's practice? Um, I think it also it depends on the artist, but at least for me, I never wanted to um, be in a situation where all of my hard-earned money, whatever way that I earned that, went to um, survival. I mean, it does, but the idea that I could work so hard, and and I think this is a stereotype too, but I've seen it where all my money goes towards uh, me working on my kitchen table because that's all I can do, right? There's no studio, there's none of that. The, the, the sort of intense pressure uh, socially that happens in New York, I think, because they're all on top of each other and the, um, the craziness of the art world just really never appealed to me. And I think that Los Angeles gives me the time and space to think in a different way, right? I, I think that um, I'm able to sit back with, you know, of course it's sunny and that's wonderful to some people, but it, th there's not that sort of New York pressure. 
I, I think I can, I found, I was able to find my voice and I think that Los Angeles gives artists that opportunity in a different way than New York does where it's, it tends to feel like it might be about something else, right? It's, you know, and it's not just the competition, but because there's competition here too, but it, they uh, manifest themselves in different ways. Right. And it's, you know, sunny all the time, which is actually kind of boring after a while. But it, it's uh, less expensive. You know, there's a lot of schools here. So there's a plethora of artists. Um, and I think the, one of the main reasons why I have, um, I think, remained was because I realized early on that because of the nature of the city, it, the attention being elsewhere and the economic situation that I could take some risks here and that um, the institutions, whether they be the museums or the galleries, were able to also take risks because they were not so focused on their overhead, right? They could show things and present things that they believed in in a different way without the worry like, oh, we're not going to have rent for next month, so let's not show this because I don't think it's going to make us money. And here they were far more willing to sort of take a lot of risks. And I really responded to that. And I think that really helped me to um, survive. Has the global financial crisis had a particular kind of impact, <clears throat> do you think, on what artists can do? <clears throat> well, I, you know, my gallery sort of imploded. Um, at near the beginning of all of that, which I think it was an early casualty. But I don't know if it was necessarily fully about that, but I know that that had an impact on it. Um, you know, I constantly hear that no one is buying anything, right? People buy at the top, top, top end of things or somewhere down uh, on the lower end. And so I'm, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. So that kind of has... Um, evaporated a lot of the monetary trans oh I sound so smart today yeah. evaporated some of the monetary transactions that would have let myself and a lot of my colleagues and peers survive but um, I was always told that um, those situations the um, um, early mid-career artists are the ones who survive so luckily I think I was in my early mid-career at that at that point so having ceased to be emerging, which, which, which helped. You know, I look at a time like that when, when there is no money around as a great time for artists, and I try to encourage everyone that I speak to that this is the time when you can also take those risks, because if no one's buying anything, it doesn't matter, right? So you, uh, I tend to think that it's kind of been good in some ways for sort of the art world that no one is willing or able to sort of support some of us. So it does a little bit of um, culling, perhaps, mm -hmm. culling of this overblown art world. Um, right, that, and that's kind of been exciting that, that, and, and sad and tragic at the same time. But I think it still allows us to sort of do whatever we want in a greater way without the, the worries of the market. But that's only for those artists who are able and willing to understand it in that way. Because, of course, I know tons who are, you know, crying and moaning and sort of um, not really taking advantage, I think, of the situation in the way that I would hope um, or encourage them to do. Right. It, and I think that does that not come in a way to turn it back again to modernism to come from some of that situation where there is no, um, right, there's not money being thrown at people. So they have to, right, modernism in a way is about uh, experimentation perhaps and uh, sort of breaking down of things to build back up. So again, the financial situation sort of can help in those situations in some respects. Now you, uh, you teach. I, I do, I do teach. I will say that I, um, I grew up on a college campus. I, uh, my father uh, was faculty, staff, sort of administration. And so it's been really important to me, but I have uh, resisted teaching for a while so that I could concentrate on things in the studio. But also with this uh, 
global financial crisis, I thought, oh, maybe it's time to um, teach in a, in a different way. And Los Angeles has always been um, home to a, not only a lot of art schools and artists, but teaching has a different um, reputation perhaps out here. It, it tends to be not as frowned on for a working artist to teach here. So I, that's really kind of nice and exciting and hopefully I will get one of these many jobs that I'm applying for now that, to build on the back on, that I've been working these past, what, 18 or so years to try and get. Yeah. How do you, how do you see? prepare um, students who are coming through, you know, for instance, you might have uh, you know, graduate students who are sort of in their early 20s and they think of a career as a practicing artist. Um, what sort of advice do you give them in terms of how you <coughs> realize that? Uh, well, with my undergraduates, uh, I, t I try to advise them to take some time off when they finish with that degree to really think about if this is something that they want to do or can do um, and are willing to do because I think that uh, I don't want to sort of sound the alarm, but I think that this is hard work that we do uh, and to be prepared for lots of suffering. Right? and to really decide if you can't do anything else then I think this might be good for you but if you have any other options sometimes I, I tend to implore them to look into those and I do the same thing for my graduate students even though I can't advise them to take the time off but I have to um, let them know what, it's, what it is really like and particularly now um, it's even more difficult because of the, that whole global money thing, right? It's, it's just really tough and that they need to um, really figure out if this is what they want to do, right? Because again, I, I try to implore to them that this is such, such important work, or it can be in some ways, and that they really need to take it seriously. I think that that has been a big problem lately. Tell me about the, the role that criticism has in developing an artist. So topic. may I ask you a question about that? Are yeah. you ta you're, you're talking more about the like academic early criticism that way? Or are you talking maybe I'm if I read a review or if we're yeah. having a studio visit, that I'm sort of about, situation? So I'm, I'm talking about at the level of you know, when, you're, when you are in art school of mm -hmm. having the, the, the feedback right. uh, from from your academic but also um, then you know uh, the critical views that you then receive. All right. Um, I think criticism and learning to sort of hear it yeah. and understand it is incredibly important, and I think that's why it's such a sort of part of um, an academic training for an artist. Uh, I, I do find that not everyone, again, is able to hear the things that, that are said to them or willing to hear the things that are said to them. I think the most important part about that whole dynamic is for a younger artist, or not necessarily a younger artist, an artist to understand the difference between, um, well, well, just that, that criticism is not directed at them. It's not that it's not a personal situation. We're talking about an inanimate object that no matter what you say, has no feelings, is not really going to change the world. And it's just about this thing, this abstract other thing. And I, I tend to feel a lot of, well, my students, that that, that that is a tricky sort of place. And I think over time they can understand that, all right, it's not necessarily about me, it's just about that thing. Even though I made it, and I might think it's the greatest thing in the world, but other people have other opinions. Now, that's sort of that situation. In terms of the other criticality or the criticism that, um, that occurs, I have just learned that to, to sort of say, I can't change, that's just one person's opinion. I can't change it, so I sort of don't deal with it that much. Just to read it, hopefully my name is spelled correctly, and that's I'm happy, um, right? Because I, I am unable to change whatever just that one person thinks, and 
I, I can't try. I don't want to. I don't want to fight it. And and again, I have to take into consideration that it's not me that they're talking about. It's just what I do, and this is just it's just work. So it, it tends to be okay. Developing a thick skin. Right. You, you, I think um, artists really have to because this is, at the end of the day, a, a game of egos in some respects. And so you have to have a very healthy ego and be able to, to deal with the, the things that this choice or life or um, discipline requires.